No, there's too much to talk about. My mind was already blown so hard with Into the Spider-Verse that I almost had no mind left to blow with Across the Spider-Verse, but blow me it did. So the movie features spider people from a bunch of different dimensions, which was already established in Into the Spider-Verse, and each world is distinctly styled and unique, with each one having its own visual language and treatment. In Into the Spider-Verse, we felt like we were immersed in a comic book while watching the film, with their 3D combined with 2.5D treatment, and in the sequel they've pushed it even further. This is something that animation as a medium allows the artists to excel at, and it's just unbelievable what they've done here. They've completely changed the game with ingenious rendering, texturing, and lighting techniques, as well as a totally unique approach to the animation and art direction. One thing that really made me excited when I was watching it is how organic and authentic it felt. It felt like watching hand-drawn or painted art from a page come to life, not like something entirely generated by a computer, with no imperfections and everything precisely calculated. And obviously it was computer generated, but the look and feel is incredibly authentic and nuanced. It's like they were fighting the computer every step of the way to bring it back to feeling more human-made or handmade and less computer made. It's really interesting to interpret how each character's personality is reflected in their character design and how their individual worlds also reflect the characters themselves. We've got Miles, Gwen, Peter B. Parker, Hobie Brown or Spider-Punk, Miguel O'Hara, Jessica Drew and Pavita Prabhaka. Miles' world is pretty much the same animation and treatment wise as it was in Into the Spider-Verse with some polishing and more evolved animation techniques, but essentially it's that same stylized 3D comic book world with halftone overlays and cross-hatching details, bend day dots in shadows and highlights, moments of chromatic aberration or CMYK offset that you get in printed comics when there's a bit of a misprint, which they use here for several different purposes, such as on lighting to show the flares or bleeding of lights, you know when a light blows through a lens, and as a form of motion blur in some instances. And they also have these really dope 2.5D accents animated over the 3D objects and scenes, giving us that dynamic comic book vibe. If you want to hear more about that, I do have a video that I did on Into the Spider-Verse and the art and animation there, along with an animation animation breakdown on some shots, so check that out if you want. There have been some upgrades to the techniques and it all feels a little more like a printed comic book with more refined textural details, and the way they interact with the 3D world, they're a bit more dynamic than in the last film. They've aged him up in this film. You can see that he's filled out a bit in his body, his shoulders are a little wider, his face has a few more lines and is more angular, but he's still got that lanky young guy still growing into his hands and feet look, like a puppy whose paws are too big. This shows us that he still has some growing up to do. He's still young and a bit green, and we even see that reflected in how he's trying to prove himself to Gwen. Like when they're swinging through the city and she's so self-assured and adept with the web, and he's trying to pretend that he's also super chilled and confident with it to impress her, and he tries not to let Gwen notice his ineptitudes. I love here where he almost hits a truck and then he's flying across the scene right after that and he's tailed by all these 2D exclamation marks as he screams and these little stylistic touches and elements really add to the comedy and charisma of the shots. But anyway, he's still learning and still pretty inexperienced and doesn't carry himself with the same confidence that Gwen does. They've also upgraded the design of his spider suit. It's a little sleeker, different materials are used, it looks kind of like a Kevlar now. You can see the details in the material of the suit particularly well when light hits it. And we've got this red under his arms and down the sides. The others kept making those cracks about him bleeding at the armpits. And I do kind of miss the previous version of his suit. Although it was more rough and ready and homemade, it really reflected his graffiti artist style, and I felt like it suited his personality more, but this upgrade is representative of his maturing. There are so many amazing details in the animation, incredible bits of attention paid to the most minute details, like when Miles and Gwen are sitting upside down, and you can see that gravity is pulling on their facial muscles, and countless other little moments where they portray the unique personality of each character so meticulously with amazing timing for the comedic moments and the really emotional sad moments. So I mentioned Gwen, let's talk about Gwen. She's still very confident as she was in the first movie, her posture and way of moving are very strong and self-assured. If you look at this pose right here, her stance doesn't leave room for self-doubt, and this is very apparent in her design as well. While she's still very young, close to Miles in age, and he still has a lot of growing into himself to do, with some parts of his body being slightly out of proportion, like his feet and hands being too big, and he's still very lanky and needs to fill out, she's very compact and sleek and proportionate, conveying a composed presence which contrasts with Miles and his self-doubt. Whereas he still moves without that confidence a lot of the time and still has slip-ups, all her actions are deliberate and poised. Her dimension, Earth 65, has a pastel watercolor treatment to it, really soft and quite dreamy, smudgy with the paint strokes sort of flowing into one another, and the line work is a lot subtler and sketchier, more like pencil work as compared to the ink style lines in Mouse's world. The color palette for a lot of the shots is reminiscent of the Spider-Gwen comic books by Robbie Rodriguez, which is a nice homage. Her world, with this softer treatment and often a complete lack of definition or objects in the environment, 
is quite a contrast to the other realities and it also has very surreal coloring. Her dimension is less harshly defined and is always dynamic, changing with her emotions, often being completely different from one beat to the next. Like here, where she's talking to her dad, explaining to him how the mask is like her badge and how she feels so alone. In this shot, we're looking up at her from below the table. We've got this cold toned turquoise painted background with quite defined brush strokes that are kind of harsh, like they've been painted with a dry brush which reflects the intensity and negativity and harshness of her emotions at that time. She's in this warmer peachy tangerine sort of color and her suit is kind of inverted in the tones here. The warm colors bringing her forward and forcing us to focus on her. And these orangey yellowish sort of strokes behind her also guide us to her as a focal point as she says this really emotional speech. The windows and perspective as well are all guiding us to look at her and really focus on her in this pivotal moment. And you'll see that the strokes and background here are all fairly simple. This is a very emotional scene and we are fully focusing on that emotional performance and they've also completely taken away any peripheral or background details. She's saying she tried so hard to wear the mask the way he, her father would want when she throws it down to the table and we have this graphic transition that's now in a different treatment, more defined, harder, reflecting the anger and resentment as it symbolizes her giving up on trying to make her dad proud and do things the way he would want her to because he let her down. And then we cut to this different angle where the color palette is now changed and so is the treatment of the whole shot. Everything is more defined, more detailed. Her colors have changed back to a more realistic color palette, back to the blonde dip dyed hair and the usual coloring of her suit and the background now with more variations in tones with purples, pinks, reds, blues, and a little bit of green and yellow light coming in through the window. And the brush strokes here are more smudged and melding together. There's still some definition in the strokes, but they look like they're painted with a wetter brush, reflecting her sadness and feelings of defeat. And we actually have these drips and rivulets literally pouring down as she speaks about how she feels she failed. She couldn't protect the people she loved. They can't know the real her and she's completely on her own. And the more she speaks, the more upset she gets, the more the paint runs and the colors start to turn darker with deep blue and red tones, becoming more reflective of how depressed and bleak she feels. The world keeps adapting to the situation and the emotions. And I also really love this part where she and her dad are finally connecting. He's realizing that he almost lost her and telling her that she's the best thing he's ever done. And we have all these kind of abstract looking shapes hovering behind him, but it sort of seems to represent mathematical instruments and shapes and angles. And it kind of feels like he's finally working out and putting the pieces of the puzzle together and realizing that he almost screwed up the most important thing in his life, which is what he's saying. So those shapes behind him seem to represent that working it out. And then her background, as she hardly dares to hope as she realizes what he's saying. Her background starts to change to reflect his as they both seem to be nearing a meeting of perspectives. And then when we cut back to him, we've got this beautiful slow movement outwards of all these circles, like a blossoming or blooming of his love for Gwen and his hope for reconciliation and this warmer and softer light beaming out from behind him. Another scene that was really impactful and so beautifully supported by the palette and treatment was this one where her dad finds out that she's Spider-Woman. And again, we're concentrating purely on the emotional performances. So the environment objects and details completely disappear and we just have these extremely textural backgrounds supporting the emotions in the scene. The colors are very saturated. It's very emotionally charged and they're both feeling really anxious and agitated. The colors and the extreme textures work really well to agitate the viewer as well. It makes you feel tense to be a part of this too. And can I just say, the devastation in his face here, the defeat in his posture, how everything sags, his shoulders, his eyes, his mouth, everything. And there's just such shock and sadness and betrayal in his eyes. It's just incredible acting with the animation. Here where he starts saying, you have the right to remain silent, we have her in the red tones on the right hand side of the screen and him in the left with one half of him bathed in blue and the other half, the side nearer to her, in the same red tones as her. So it's like one half of him is still holding on to her, not wanting to believe that she's Spider-Woman who he hates, and the other half is wanting to support his daughter. But then we cut to the next scene and we can see he's made his choice because he's all blue now. He's no longer sharing any of her color palette. And then that's confirmed here where she asks if he's really that afraid of her. And he's all in blue, she's in red. These are opposite colors on the spectrum. They're directly opposed and he has decided that she's the enemy. It's awesome how they've melded styles together throughout the film. Like when the vulture attacks Gwen and he's in such a different but just as distinctive style. He's all in sepia tones as if drawn on parchment paper, harsh sketchy pencil lines and scribbled instructions, very inspired by Leonardo da Vinci. His whole design and character is very reminiscent of da Vinci's sketches and inventions as da Vinci wasn't only an artist but a polymath who dabbled in the sciences, architecture, engineering and the vulture speaks Italian just like da Vinci. He's such a contrast to the beautifully colored painterly and soft treatment of Gwen's world with his monochrome coloring and cut out parchment style yet they still work really well together. So let's talk about someone who seems to be everybody's favorite, mine included, Hobie Brown, Spider-Punk. Hobie stands out not just because he's the cool laid-back anti-establishment 
establishment anarchist punk rockers so many of us secretly wish we could be, but also because of how dynamic and frankly awe-inspiring his animation and visual treatment is. It's so unique, I don't think we've ever seen anything like it. He even says himself he doesn't believe in consistency, so even his animation and design is inconsistent. Consistently inconsistent, if you will. I feel like consistent isn't even a word anymore, I've said it too many times. He's like a living collage, very reminiscent of the hand-cut and pasted styles of punk rock posters in London in the 70s, very sex pistols. His dimension also follows the theme of magazine and newspaper cutouts with quite sketchy and messy line work like roughly drawn marker, just like in the punk rock album covers and posters. There are these sort of newspaper misprint effects in the colors, like when there's an error on the printing press, and lots of halftone shading and printing grain and paper texture, and these cool effects as well of stuff being drawn over the cutouts. It's all very chaotic, just like Hobie's character design style. What is so impressive about him is that apart from the constantly changing graphic styles and textures, even his animation itself is inconsistent. Different parts of him are animated at different frame rates. That's freaking mind-blowing. Do you know how much work would have gone into just this character? Coming up with a way to define the different graphic styles and textures on him and have those change based on his performance and what's happening in the scene and then on top of that different frame rates for different elements? What the hell, man? So in Spider-Verse and a lot of animation, the frame rate varies depending on what you're trying to do with your scene. Like something with a lot of action will often be animated on ones, which means that there are 24 drawings or frames per second of animation. But often slower scenes will be animated on twos, which means 12 frames per second of animation because you don't need that much detail in your movements. So an image or drawing is held for two frames. So varying your frame rate between ones and twos is not super uncommon, but for the most part in the Spider-Verse movies, the characters are animated on twos, except for the super fast action parts. The thing with Hobie though is that his body is mostly animated on threes. Like check out the scene here for instance. If I go through it frame by frame, you'll see there's only movement in his body every three frames, right? But you'll also notice that his guitar with this cutout color block treatment is also animating at a different frame rate than the rest of his body. His guitar is animating on fours and all the while his textures are changing too. Let's look at another shot with him. We can see here that again, his body's on threes, guitar on fours, and his vest is also offset in its timing. And if you look at that blue outline around him, that's also animating at a different frame rate than his body. And that's not even talking about the fact that they had so many different graphic treatments and textures and line work styles that they had to develop just for him. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. This would have been such a mission for the look dev and texturing departments to get this to work. Apparently this took three years to develop. That's just for one character. Miguel O'Hara is the anti-hero from 2099. His world is futuristic, inspired by Sid Mead's illustrations of what the future could look like. His design is intimidating, bold, and aggressive. He's a beefcake. Maybe you've seen the pictures of his butt circulating the internet. People sure are thirsty. You can see he has wider shoulders and a stockier build than the other spider people. The shape language of his design is quite geometric. A little unfriendly in style because he's not as pure of a character. He's a bit of an anti-hero. With the addition of his sharp claws, his silhouette is very aggressive and intimidating. His line work is distinctive and sharp and sort of like a thin sketchy pen, with some lines even coming off of his geometry. And his colors are dark with this etched inking in his shading. He wears a black suit, but it always has a blue shade because in comics, because of the four color printing process, black tones would appear bluish and would use blue for highlights as the color palettes were limited. And these are all very cool stylistic choices to pull through from the comics. His suit is super techy with this kind of spiderweb pattern, but with a kind of a circuit board twist and the shimmer that plays over it once in a while. Futuristic AF. It's very much like the art in the Spider-Man 2099 comics. I love how the textures and unique details are brought into Miguel's dimension with stuff like the lighting, like this volumetric lighting here, having these brushstroke details in it and these texture details on some other environment elements. They kind of look like Copic marker, the way they define strokes, but kind of blending into one another. When we're outside, we start to see a little more how Miguel's dimension has this almost unfinished quality. It's still quite sketchy in some places, still has like those construction lines that you'd have when plotting out your perspective and textures on the page. And this is a metaphor for the future not being a surety. It's still in the air and still being built. Even though Miguel acts like the future and what has to happen is a sure thing, it can actually still be changed. It's still a work in progress. It's so amazing the way each character is still in the style of their own world, but perfectly placed and grounded in another, stylistically completely different dimension without looking completely out of place. We still have each character having their specific individual treatment. Like here, the halftone texture in the lighting and shadows as it hits Miles, or here as the light passes over his face, there are these subtle halftone edge details, and when we look at Gwen, she's still got her painterly tones and details in her texturing, and the smudgy oil pastel detail coming up off the edges of her body. Okay, let's talk about Pavito Prabhaka. I just love how he's so upbeat and funny. He lives in Mumbatan, which is an amalgamation of Manhattan and Mumbai, 
It's super colorful and busy and the lighting is very warm. You've got that nice lemony sky and there's some chromatic aberration between colors. And we also have some added texture of these subtle bende dots in some areas and even more printing effects where the colors look like they've been printed slightly offset from the line work, like over here. It all very much gets a feeling of kind of more old school comics. The line work is sort of pencil vibes, not strong, black, harsh or particularly obvious. They blend in quite a lot with the colors, but there is a lot of detail in that line work, which contributes to how busy and full of life it all feels. His suit is beautifully designed to reflect his culture because his dimension or world as I mentioned is modeled partly on Mumbai. He's got a stylized ticker or tilak on his forehead which is traditionally placed on the third eye and denotes which spiritual lineage a person is a devotee of in the Hindu faith. His mask also has some really interesting details around the eyes and when I looked further into that it seems that it's influenced by Hindu theater and ritual art. They've got his heels and toes bare which also has cultural significance. In India going barefoot signifies respect for the earth and the barefoot is believed to be the conduit that the energy from the earth travels through. Shoes are often removed when in the house and always removed when visiting temples as a sign of respect. He uses what seems to be a sort of combination of a diabolo, which is a yo-yo of Chinese origins, and a damaru, which is a small drum used in Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism with his web. He's also got these details on his hands which seem to be inspired by henna designs, which commonly represent good luck and good spirits, which he definitely has, and he also wears a dhoti, which is this piece of cloth wrapped to look like pants. Jessica Drew is designed with a red, yellow, and black color scheme. She's also very pregnant. Her treatment and rendering is very slick. She's got these nice, sharp, clean, shiny highlights, and her line work is also pretty clean and solid. She's a lot more graphic novel in style than comic book, cleaner and more high contrast. We've got this etching detail here in the shading, but also these very strong, solid black shadows on her too. Everything about her design reflects her strength and confidence. The colors, the line work, the rendering, there's nothing unsure or unformed about her. She's a great example of how anybody can wear the mask, like what Gwen said that one time, even a pregnant woman. Peter B. Parker is pretty much the same old same old as in the previous movie so I won't spend too much time on him. Loving his pink fluffy robe and of course he now has a new accessory, his baby. I do love him as a character. The Spot is another really interestingly treated character. He's white with an uneven sort of smudging, he's not just pure white with sketchy line work, and you can still even see the joint outlines on him sometimes, like he's unfinished and the artist hasn't quite finished plotting out his structure and still needs to erase those pencil lines. Because he kind of is unfinished. Even he is still learning about himself and his new body and his capabilities. The ink spots on him feel alive and are always changing and are very dynamic. It's awesome how they've combined all these different styles and types of film as the spot jumps between locations, even dropping into a live action scene at one point. His design and silhouette perfectly supports how his character is kind of goofy, even though he's the villain. I mean, he's kind of disproportionate with his long limbs and big hands and kind of weirdly small feet and this dumpy trunk, supporting his comedic overtones. Nobody really respects him. But then he gets his makeover and he becomes quite a bit more intimidating and creepy with his unbalanced posture and elongated arms. And his coloring has inverted, so he's mostly black with his spots in white and these manic white scribbles. And something that I thought was really interesting was how it seems like maybe this was foreshadowed by the great expectations Graffiti Mouse did in the first movie with his uncle Aaron which looks eerily similar to the spot in this form. The way they brought the chaos and volatility of this form to life with the flashes of white scribbled lines, the constant flickering and the tempestuous background leaching into the environment around him was genius. And it really gave you an oh shit moment because previously we hadn't been taking the spot too seriously and then we realized shit's gonna go down with him in this new form. I feel like Into the Spider-Verse and now Across the Spider-Verse even more so, really celebrate animation and its possibilities and use it to its greatest extent. Across the Spider-Verse feels like a tactile, mixed media work of art and it's no wonder that people are blown away by it. It's incredible. And I'm so excited to be living in a time when it came out and see how it influences animation, inspires other animators and production companies to keep pushing the envelope in terms of what's possible in animation, and pushes them to be even more experimental and daring in their visual treatments and animation styles. Quite an essay and I didn't even get to cover half of the stuff that I wanted to. There's just way too many tiny fascinating details. I also left out my usual animation breakdown where I take a shot or a scene from the movie and I dissect it and examine the animation in really minute detail. But I know a lot of you did enjoy the ones that I did for Arcane and other animated films that I've done, so let me know if you do want me to do one for Across the Spider-Verse. I can always do another video on that for you if you'd like me to, so let me know in the comments if you do. Subscribe if you want to keep up to date with my other videos, and if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up to help with the algorithm. Comment below if you've noticed any interesting details or noticed anything about the animation or the graphics from Across the Spider-Verse, because I'd love to know more. I cannot wait to see what they do with the next movie. Thank you to my awesome patrons. I really appreciate the support from you and it gives me a lot of motivation to keep going with these videos. So thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye.